Hello, Astro Lab students. I'd like to give you some instructions on your next lab. This lab is uh, different from most of the labs we've done in that it's not based on the NAAP website. Um, there's no website you need to use. We are going to use Stellarium though. And this is all about how astronomers measure the distances to faraway objects using a variety of te techniques. Really, this lab is only about the first of those techniques, the first in the so-called distance chain. You're going to learn, hopefully, in your lecture class that there's four or five really important techniques for measuring distances, and they all depend on each other, or they depend on the previous one in the chain. And the very first one is parallax. So let's review the concept of para parallax. Since you're by yourself, I presume, or at the very least you're around friends or family, you're not in front of your classmates, you shouldn't be embarrassed to do the following. Pick an object in the room, you know, something on the wall, maybe a picture frame on the wall, and hold your thumb out at arm's length. So stretch your arm out and cover, excuse me, not cover, um, squint one eye. You could cover one eye. Close one of your eyes and cover the picture frame or whatever the object is, cover that with your thumb. Okay, so you should be looking at your thumb, which is covering that faraway object, and you've only got one eye open. And now what I'd like you to do is switch eyes. Ready? You should have seen something like that. Your thumb should have appeared to jump around. Now what I'd like you to do is repeat that, and this time, don't have your thumb all the way out. Put your thumb quite a bit closer. Oh, that's an interesting view of my thumb there. Put your thumb quite a bit closer to your eye. Cover up that object as before. Okay, and now you're gonna switch eyes. And you should have seen something like this. This time your finger appeared to move even more. So that effect is called parallax. And it has to do with the fact that when you view something from a particular direction, it appears to be in front of um, one background. But if you view it from another direction, it appears to be in front of a different background. So let's, uh, Imagine taking a top view now. Here was your thumb. I'll just put a circle here to represent your thumb. Yeah, and let's say uh, when you first line your thumb up over the star, your right eye was closed. So here's your left eye. Let me give you some eyelashes there. And the line of sight from your eyeball to your thumb passes through whatever the object was that you were covering, like the picture frame. But then if you keep your thumb where it is and you switch to your right eyeball, now the line of sight from your eyeball to your thumb goes off in some different direction. I guess you're a mutant here. I put way too much distance between your eyeballs. Sorry about that. And hopefully that's the effect that you observed. Now, when I demonstrated it with my thumb, I had my thumb going off to the right. So that would have corresponded to looking first with your right eye and then with your left, but you get the idea. So that, that uh, effect is called parallax. And this angle is called the parallax angle. For now, I'll just call it alpha, but the amount uh, by which it shifts in direction, that's called the parallax angle. And we can use that effect to measure far away objects, not too far. You certainly can't uh, measure a distant galaxy's distance, but we're gonna measure the moon in Stellarium using that concept. So, uh, here's the idea with measuring the distances to stars. Never mind about the moon. Forget about that for a second. Uh, instead of a thumb, imagine you're looking at a nearby star. So this is going to confuse you now because I used a star symbol for the faraway object. Now I'm using the star symbol for a close object. So here's the sun. And we know that uh, planet Earth goes around and around the sun. I've been around a number of times now, it feels like. <clears throat> and uh, let's say this is a star that's pretty close to our own solar system. Of course, this is not to scale at all. Everything about this picture is silly because if this really was the size of the sun, planet Earth would barely be a dot on the page. You couldn't even see it, and it would be off the page. In fact, it would be off my desk. It would be out of the room. It would be across the street. That's probably far enough across the street. Um, and also, this would be way further away, off the page, definitely off the property here, probably in another, in fact, definitely in another state. There's so much space between stars. So this is really a silly picture, but uh, let's pretend there's some other background stars way out here. So these are super far away stars. This is a nearby star. 
I wish I had a ruler here. Here we go. And let's say this is uh, January. This corresponds to January. When you use a telescope to observe this star, this star will appear to be in front of the stars back here. But then six months later, what's that? One plus six, seven, so July. In July, when you look at that same star, it appears to be in front of a different group of stars. stars. So it looks like it's shifting back and forth with the annual motion of the Earth. Again, that's called parallax. In this case, it would be the, the stellar parallax. And truthfully, I think they take it to be half of this angle, but that's, that's just details. That's the basic idea. And you can see that if, if the nearby star were farther out, you wouldn't get as much of a shift. Like if I used, if I was trying to measure the parallax of that star, then the, the shift would be smaller. Yeah, it's hard to tell on this diagram. That's called stellar parallax. And that was maybe the first accurate method for measuring the distances to nearby stars. It's still being done, except now it's being done with ultra precision because they have all these expensive telescopes up in space now with uh, modern cameras making incredibly high definition images of, uh, of these stars and they're able to measure the parallax. Okay, now I didn't mean to get into all this detail because we don't need all this for the lab, but uh, people in like, uh, you know, antiquity, Greek times, I think some of those scholars had wondered if the earth does in fact go around the sun, but they realized that if it does, they, they would expect to see this effect. They should be able to see some of the stars appear to be moving back and forth, and they were never able, able to observe that, because you can never see that with the naked eye. It's such a small effect. Um, and so they figured, we just don't go around the sun, because if we did, we would observe that. I'm sure some of them realized wait a minute, maybe they're just super far away, and that's why we can't detect it. But they had a hard time accepting that the world could be that big. Because remember, they hadn't even discovered America yet, so their scope was limited. Okay, what we're doing today is something different. We're looking at um, the parallax of the moon, which is much easier to detect because the moon is way closer. So first, let me review some terminology. Let me draw a sphere. Pretend this is planet Earth. And there's a, a city right here called Greenwich, England. Greenwich. And imagine a line drawn from the North Pole down to the South Pole through that point. That's called a meridian. In fact, that's the, uh, is that the prime meridian? I think it's the prime meridian. And what you could do is draw 180 of those all the way around. Or you could just do one every 15 degrees, I think it is. Yeah, just do 15 degrees. 15 degrees, and you'll end up being able to do 24 of those. Those correspond to the time zones, but these are called lines of longitude, in addition to meridians. They're also called lines of longitude. So uh, the, uh, the Greenwich meridian is considered to be zero degrees. And if you go 15 degrees this way around the circle, this would be the line of 15 degrees longitude. So here's that word longitude. This line would be uh, 30 degrees longitude, et cetera. And if you keep going west from Greenwich for quite a while, eventually you'll get to 118 degrees west, and that's where we are in Los Angeles, give or take. Uh, so that's one number for locating where you are on the sphere. Or of course, if you just say you're at um, 45 degrees west longitude, 15, 30, 45, that just means you're somewhere on this line. But that, that's still ambiguous. You know, Are you up here in the Northern Hemisphere? Are you down here? So we need another number, and for that, they've got these lines of latitude. And again, you could chop those. Actually, the way they do it is 90 up here and 90 down here. So if, if this is the equator, I'll put EQ for equator. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four. I've chopped this up into four pieces. Uh, that doesn't divide evenly. Anyway, let me just make up a number. Maybe this is 20 degrees up from the, whoops, 20 degrees up from the equator. 40 degrees, 60 degrees, I ran out of space, but you get the idea. Uh, so these, these are lines of constant latitude. I'll put, uh, lat, oops, I spelled that, latitude, constant, oh, that's messy. But you get the idea, right? Everything, every point on this circle is at the same latitude. These are all at a higher latitude. Down here, we're, we're at a southern latitude. Okay, so if you first specify your longitude, how far this direction are you, and then how far up or down, which would be your latitude, you can locate any point 
on the sphere. You just need two numbers to specify your position. And I'm talking about this because uh, in this lab, you need to refer to something similar, latitude and longitude, not on planet Earth, but on another sphere. You guessed it, the celestial sphere. And I wanna make this picture big enough. There, I can use this piece of paper here. Okay, so here's a giant imaginary dome. Remember, there is no actual shell out in space, but let's call this the celestial sphere. And here's, think of planet Earth at the very middle, or excuse me, the very center of the universe. There's planet Earth and everything else is going around. So this is how people used to conceive of the universe and it's still a useful device, even though it's not uh, accurate. You can still do a lot of accurate math with it. So uh, every star, planet, the moon, et cetera, that you see in the, night sky, in the night sky can be thought of as being located on that sphere. So you've got stars at various positions, you know, maybe the Big Dipper's here, Orion's over here. And those stars, during your lifetime at least, they stay fixed on that sphere. But then there are things that wander, right? We know that the planets seem to go in circles around the Earth for several years, or over a period of several years. Same thing with the sun, and same thing with the moon. So let's talk about the coordinates on the celestial sphere. You'd like to be able to, um, to specify where something is on the sphere. So much like latitude and longitude, you can, you can draw these imaginary circles around the sphere, and you can even imagine lines of, well, that's supposed to go through the South Pole there, lines of longitude. Okay, so if you're talking about some particular star on the celestial sphere, you could get its, uh, which line of longitude it's on and which line of latitude it's on. Of course, that would actually be this line of longitude and this line of latitude. And in that way, you could specify its location. And the stars have coordinates that stay relatively fixed over time. They do change gradually. And the reason for that is a little complicated. We don't need to go into that, but they're mostly constant. But the moon is wandering around the celestial sphere constantly because it orbits the Earth. So uh, the moon doesn't actually orbit in this plane like you might think. It orbits more like this. So I'm gonna draw the moon at some arbitrary position. Here's the moon. And if you were on Earth looking at the moon, the moon would appear to be at this position on the celestial sphere. Remember, you're on the Earth, you can't see the distances here. As far as you can tell, the moon is in the same direction as whatever's back here. So if there's a star, like right here, from your point of view, the moon would appear to be right next to that star. All, all you can tell is direction, you can't tell depth. So, at least not without measurements. <clears throat> um, I should point out that they don't call it lang latitude and longitude on the celestial sphere. They have different words, and I'll just write the correspondence here. Lines of longitude, are given a different name. They're called, uh, the, the longitude coordinate is called the right ascension. Right ascension. And we will not need that for this lab. The lines of latitude, instead of the coordinate being called latitude, it's called declination. Declination. If we go back to the picture here, uh, this is the celestial equator. Any point on the celestial sphere down here would have a, excuse me, would have a negative declination. Anything up here would have a positive declination. And I'm going to use the Greek letter delta, that's lowercase delta, for the declination. So you just ask, what's the angle between the direction to an object that we see in the night sky, the angle between that direction and the celestial equator? So if you pointed your fingers at the equator, or one hand at the equator and the other hand with your pointer finger at the moon, what's the angle between your arms? That's really all it is, declination. But keep in mind that the moon's declination is changing because if the moon is orbiting the Earth like this, sometimes the moon is above the equator, sometimes it's below, and its declination and right ascension would be changing constantly. And you can go into Stellarium and watch that happen. I'll probably show you that in a moment. Now here's where the parallax comes in. So I'm going to exaggerate this a little bit. Let, let me actually put the, the Earth here. I'll just draw half the Earth. E for Earth, and here's the ginormous celestial sphere, celestial sphere. And remember, 
the moon's going around and around. It takes about a month to do that. Sometimes it's above, sometimes it's below. So what you're going to do in Stellarium, and by the way, the handout that I'll be posting has all these instructions in it, but I'm getting you a head start with a, a verbal explanation here. You need to fast forward time and find a moment. It could be next month. It could be a thousand years from now. Just find a day in Stellarium on which the, um, the moon appears to be on the celestial equator. So the moon would have to be right here as seen from somebody on Earth's equator. See that? If the moon was right here and you're standing on Earth's equator, then when you look at the moon, it would appear to be on the celestial equator at zero degrees declination. That's the first thing you'll have to do. So first make sure you're on Earth's equator. I'll do that, I'll demonstrate that in Stellarium. Then find a day on which the moon is exactly at zero degrees declination. And then what you'll do is put yourself at the North Pole. And truthfully, it doesn't have to be the North Pole. This method would also work if it was at the South Pole. So here's you now at the North Pole. Now in real life, you can't be in two places at once. So you'd have to have a, a co-researcher, a buddy, go up to the North Pole and make the measurement at the same time as you. Uh, for this person, when they look at the moon, their line of sight passes through the moon and intercepts the celestial sphere somewhere else. So the moon may appear to you to be at zero degrees declination, but for the person at the North Pole, the moon would appear to have a negative declination. That's called parallax. And this, this angle that I'm calling delta, I'm calling it delta because it, it really is the declination, right? It happens to also be the parallax angle in this case. As you move from here to here, uh, you're experiencing parallax. The moon appears to be here, and then it would appear to shift down here. And you know what? I forgot to point something out here. Let me get back to this in just a moment. Uh, the thing with your thumb, uh, when you switch to eyeballs and your thumb appeared to jump against the background, the uh, switching eyeballs corresponds to being uh, six months apart for planet Earth. Right? When, you, when you're on planet Earth looking at the nearby star in January, that's like having your right eye open. And then when you switch eyes, that's like being uh, on the other side of Earth's orbit six months later looking at the same star. So this is like the thumb that you're looking at. These are like your eyeballs. But now, when it comes to the lunar parallax, switching eyeballs would correspond to moving from the equator to the North Pole. And instead of the thumb, whose parallax you observed at the beginning of this video, it's the moon whose par parallax you will observe. In, in other words, you're going to observe the lunar parallax, the lunar parallax, the parallax of the moon. Okay, well, the math is actually very simple. However, some of you haven't seen it in a while. You have to use just one function from trigonometry. So uh, I'm gonna have to redraw this because I didn't leave enough space on the page. We're going to use the sine function to do this. Here's planet Earth. Here's the moon. And celestial sphere here. I'm sorry, I think I keep writing with the picture off the page. So when you're at the equator, I'll just put a dot looking at the moon. Remember, you're gonna find the day on which the moon as viewed from Earth's equator appears to be on the celestial equator. That's zero degrees declination. And then for somebody up here, the moon would appear to be down there. Again, and I'm gonna call this angle delta, delta. Okay, we'll check this out. I'm going to extend this line just a little bit to the center of the Earth. And then I'll draw in the radius of the Earth, right? This is the diameter, this is the radius. And now we're dealing with a right triangle because this is 90 degrees. And you remember from high school math, there's a lot you can do with right triangles. Okay, so darn it, I'm realizing I've forgotten which letters I used in the lab manual. I think I, I, think I remember. So the hypotenuse here, that's the longest side in this right triangle. I'm gonna call that D for distance. And I believe I, believe I called this uh, R or REM. The distance between the Earth and Moon. Yeah, I believe that's what it was. Uh, REM is distance from Earth to Moon. In fact, I'm going to pause this and make sure I'm using the same letters that I did in the manual. 
Okay. Don't even need that distance, so let's not worry about it. However, this distance, I am going to call capital R for the radius of the Earth. And if you're curious, uh, that, that number is roughly 4,000 miles. You'd have to dig 4,000 miles straight down to the center of the Earth to get there. That's a, an approximate figure. Okay, so we have a right triangle. And what we're going to do is relate the known radius of the Earth. Oop, we're going to relate the known radius of the Earth to the distance from the person at the North Pole to the center of the moon. And I have to talk about the sine function to do that. But this is the, the uh, number that you're going to measure in stellarity. You will measure the lunar parallax by having two observers uh, note the position of the moon, the declination of the moon at the same time. That's the whole point is maybe you had planned ahead. You knew when the moon would be on the equator, celestial equator, as viewed from Earth's equator. And so on that day, you had your friend go to the North Pole, you know, a week in advance, set up, and at the exact moment where you observe the moon to be here, your, your other researcher would have to observe the moon's declination as seen from the top. And then whatever, whatever that declination is, that's the parallax angle. Okay, so let's talk about the sine function. We'll come back to this diagram. Here's how it works. I've drawn, or I'm going to draw two right triangles, and these triangles are similar meaning they have the same shape. This angle is the same as that angle. This angle is the same as that angle. And of course, this is 90 and that's 90. They're both right triangles. Okay, so if I call this side lowercase a, lowercase b, and lowercase c, I'm gonna call these something different. Um, I'll call this theta one, and I'll call this theta two. Those are the labels for the angles. So. If theta one equals theta two, if these really are similar triangles and this angle is the same as that angle, then A compared to C, you know, how long is this compared to how long is this? That's the same ratio as if I compare lowercase a to lowercase c. So even though big A is longer than lowercase a, and big C is longer than lowercase c, when I take the ratio of, it, of these two, when I ask how they compare, that comparison is the same as this comparison because they're similar triangles. And this ratio is actually called the sine of theta. So uh, let's just forget about one versus two. I'll just call it theta. Well, here, sine of theta one. And usually it's written S-I-N-E. That's the full name, but we abbreviate it abbreviated S-I-N, but it's not pronounced sin, it is sine. Sine of theta one is sine of theta two. Well, here's how you do it. Uh, whatever angle you're talking about, the sine of that angle, it's something that depends on the angle. So if you were to use your calculator, you would give the calculator what this angle is. Is it 20 degrees? Put that number in the calculator. Is it 40 degrees? Put that in. And then the calculator would compute something based on that angle, and here's what it would do it would take the length of the opposite side. See how this side is opposite that angle, opposite. We say that this side is adjacent to this angle, but you take the opposite side and you divide it by the hypotenuse. That's it, opposite side over hypotenuse. A over C, so I'll say opposite over hypotenuse. I'm just abbreviating, opposite over hypotenuse. Now, there are other trig functions you're probably familiar with, the cosine of this angle would be the adjacent side, B, divided by C. The tangent would be A over B. There's even the secant, which would be one over cosine. So that would be C over B. I even learned about something called the haver sine recently that sailors used to use. There's, so there's a whole bunch of trig functions. We only need one for this lab. And you just have to use your calculator to find the sine because your calculator knows what the sine is for a whole bunch of different angles. It knows how to calculate that. And if you wanna know how it does that, you're gonna to have to take uh, two semesters of calculus to learn the answer to that. It's called a power series. It's really just a bunch of addition, or multiplication and addition. Okay, so let's go back to this picture here. And check it out. Let's look at the right, ang right triangle we're talking about. This is the, the angle that you'll be measuring in Stellarium. Because do you see that this angle is the same as that angle? The declination of the moon as seen by the person on the North Pole, is delta. 
So the sine of delta should be equal to the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. That's it. So opposite over hypotenuse. Well, this is the number that you'll measure in Stellarium. This number, you're going to have to Google. I will let you look this up. You need to know the radius of the Earth. But I have another uh, couple words to say about that. This is what you're calculating. This is the number that needs to come out of your work. And I will be looking to see that you showed your work. The lab instructions say it. You got to show your work. If you just write it down, I'm not going to give you credit. Show me how you got this number using your calculator. And what you're really doing is measuring the distance from Earth to the moon, which is pretty cool, right? Because the measurements that you're going to simulate in Stellarium, you can imagine doing them in real life. Okay, so you'll be measuring the distance from Earth to the moon, specifically from the North Pole to the center of the moon, using this, uh, this notion of parallax. And that's pretty similar to what astronomers would actually do. Okay, now if we want D, we have to solve for D. So um, how about I just take the reciprocal of both sides, one over sine delta equals D over R. And then I could just multiply both sides by R to get rid of the R, right? So those would cancel. And I would find that the distance is R over sine of delta. Okay, so you'll Google this value. And I think I asked that you look this up in kilometers, and then you'll have to divide by the sine of delta. Okay, now let me just do a, a sample calculation for you. The numbers I'm about to use are not at all what your numbers will be. So for example, if the radius of our planet was um, 2,500 kilometers, it's not. And what if the parallax angle was mm, 2.7 degrees? Here's how I would do it with my calculator. Your calculator may be different because of order of operations and, and things like that. So I would take 2,500 kilometers, that's R, and divide it by the sine of 2.7. That's what I have to put into the calculator. So let me say a few things about that. First of all, this is an angle in degrees, not radians. You need to first make sure that your calculator is set in degree mode. So if you look very carefully, mine actually, you can't see it, but it says DEG. I'm already in degree mode. So the calculator is expecting that when I put an angle in, it's in degrees. I could also put it into radian mode, shift mode, radian. You can't see it, but now it says RAD. So the calculator assumes that if I enter an angle, that that angle is in radians. And if I actually enter it in degrees, it won't come out right. So make sure you're in degree mode. I'll put it back in degree mode here because you're going to enter your angle in degrees. Okay, so here's how I, here's how I would do it on my, um, you know, I'll just show you a couple different ways. First, let me find the sine of 2.7. On my calculator, you put the 2.7 first, then you take the sine. On yours, your, your calculator might be fancier. It's got parentheses. You could, you may have to do it differently. So you'll have to learn the syntax on yours. Now, since it's in the denominator, I'm going to take the reciprocal. Okay, so this is 1 over the sine of 27. And now I will multiply by 2,500. And that would tell me that this, the moon would be 530,000. Oops, 53,072 kilometers away. Of course, that's not the right number. But you, obviously, you're expecting this to come out bigger than this. Now, here's another way I could do it on my calculator. I could just say 2,500 divided by, and I enter 2.7 first, then I hit the sign button. And the calculator is smart. The calculator knows to first compute the sign and then do the division. I get the same answer. You could even do it this way. I could say 2.7. Take the sign of that and then put that in memory. So shift, memory input, clear. So that number is in memory. I can say 2,500 divided by memory recall. There's a bunch of ways you could do it. Figure out how to use your calculator. Okay, now here's a very important point I should have made at the beginning of the video. Your numbers should not come out like anybody else's numbers in the class. I don't want to see that. So uh, there are many days where the moon will appear to be on the equator. Maybe just fast forward like 100 years in the future to make sure that you're getting a day nobody else is using. I'm gonna be, I'm, I'll be looking to see that your numbers are unique. Okay, where should we go next? 
One of the nuances of this lab is the fact that the Earth doesn't really have a single radius. You'd like to think that the Earth is a perfect sphere, but it's, it's squashed a little bit. In fact, this is grossly exaggerated, but it's, it's a little bit like this. So if we call this the radius, that would be shorter than this. I'm going to call this the polar radius, R sub P, because it's the radius uh, from center to pole, North Pole, and this would be the equatorial radius. Which radius are we interested in? I'm sure you realize that already, but if I go back to the picture here, from the center to the North Pole, what we really want is the polar radius. Yeah, that'll be up to you to Google. Figure out what the polar radius of the Earth is in kilometers, and to give you a, a sense of why the Earth is shaped like that, I'll pull up a video on the YouTube. Yes, I know it's YouTube, not the YouTube. I know that's probably cooler than anything else I've shown you this semester. One other um, mathematical detail that we need to talk about is the way in which angles are presented in Stellarium. There actually is an option to change the way this is done, but I'm going to show you how to convert from, uh, from what is it, degrees, minutes, seconds to so called decimal degrees. So, you know how we chop. Now, this is a right angle. We chop this up into 90 pieces, each, each of which is a degree. Uh, well, a lot of the times in astronomy, you're talking about angles much smaller than that. Do you remember that if you take your pinky and hold it out at arm's length, we did this the first week of class or first month, that the size of your pinky in your field of view is about one degree? Well, uh, the moon is only about half the width of your pinky when you hold your pinky at arm's length at arm's distance. So you could say half of a degree, or you could say let one degree equal 60 minutes. So you chop the degree into 60 pieces, each of which is called a, uh, a minute. So half a degree is basically, or is 30 minutes. So you, instead of saying that the moon is about half degree in angular size, you could say it's 30 minutes of arc, minutes of arc. That way we don't think you're talking about minutes of time. Well, a lot of things, again, in astronomy are even smaller than a minute. So one minute is chopped up into 60 seconds of arc. There's all kinds of things that change, like uh, things that people measure every year that only change by a few seconds of arc. Um, if you talk about the size of a star in your field of view, that's probably uh, less than one minute of arc, so you'd have to use seconds. Well, if there's 60, of those in a minute and 60 minutes in a degree, you can see that one degree is 60 times 60 or 3,600 seconds of arc. So very often in astronomy, people like to measure angles using degrees, minutes, seconds. And I'm gonna show you how to convert from that form to decimal degrees. It's very easy. Here's an example. Let's see if I can fit this all in one line. What if you measure that uh, the I don't know, you're looking at um, a nebula in the night sky, a big cloudy spot, and you find that it's four degrees across, but it's also another 27 minutes and two, that's zero two, seconds of arc. And instead of expressing that with the degrees, minutes, second, the base 60 notation, what if we'd like to put it in decimal form? Here's how you do it. Well, that would be four degrees plus 27 sixtieths of a degree, right? Isn't a minute one sixtieth of a degree? So this would be 27 sixtieths. And then uh, one, one arc second is, is one over 360. I don't even know how to say that. One 360th, no, 3,600. One 3,600th, there we go. One arc second is one 3,600th of one degree. So this is two, 36 hundredths, you don't actually have to say it, you just have to do it in your calculator. That's zero, zero uh, degrees. So all you'd have to do is add all this up in your calculator. I'll do it right now. If you really wanna be lazy, I suppose I don't mind going online and you can just have it converted that way. You can find calculators that will do that for you. Even my $10 calculator here, my Casio will do that 
there's a, actually a mode for conversion. So four plus 27 sixtieth plus two over 3,600 and I get 4.4505 degrees. That's decimal form. Let me check that. I've got the button right here. Let's see here. Four degrees, 27 minutes, and two seconds. Now, how do I convert that? Ah, uh -huh. there's a little arrow above this button. So if I do shift first and then hit that button, it should convert. Nice. Okay, your calculator may have that too. You will need your angle in decimal degrees. That's what you're going to plug into the sine function. When you evaluate D as polar radius over the sine of your parallax angle, you need to enter this in decimal degrees. Okay, the last thing I need to talk about is how to use Stellarium. Okay, I, I sure hope I've done this right and that you can now see what I'm doing in Stellarium. Let me get this video panel out of the way. Okay, this is all explained in the manual, but the first thing you need to do, remember, is fast forward into the future. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna go up to the date here and just put myself arbitrarily here. I'll go with the year 3020. And you know what, there's something I didn't put, I keep forgetting to put this in the instructions themselves. You must, in your lab report, you must tell me uh, the date and time of your observation. I need to know that. So somewhere in, uh, on your lab submission, please indicate the date and time. Uh, now, that, I'm not going to write that time down because I have to look for a day on which the moon is where I want it to be. So that's not the time that you would write down. First, you need to put the moon where it needs to be. So I'm going to get rid of the ground here. Hit G for ground. If you want to get rid of these cardinal directions, hit Q. And now I'd like to see those lines of latitude and longitude, which are really called right ascension and declination. So I will hit E for equatorial coordinate system. And you can see everything's tilted. So if you go down here to the camera or the telescope icon, you can switch the way in which the telescope is mounted. Control M does the same thing. OK, now hopefully you recognize we're looking at lines of constant latitude, AKA declination. Here's the zero degree declination line, also known as the celestial equator. And if you would have, if you would have put a bold line for the celestial equator, I think it's period. Yeah, so now if I tap E, the rest of them just go away, but I'll, I'll keep them there for, uh, for now. Now, where is the moon? There's the moon. The moon is nowhere near the celestial equator. The first thing you need to do though, is put yourself on Earth's equator. We need to be an observer on Earth's equator. So let me right click to get rid of this information. And I'll go to the location window. You could try to just arbitrarily click where you know the equator is, like the country of Ecuador. But the best way to do it would be to enter the latitude. What is your latitude at the equator? It should be zero degrees, zero minutes, and zero seconds. Now you're your longitude doesn't matter, so I'm just going to leave that blank. But you probably should hit tab to make sure that it processes that value. And you can see it's dumped us somewhere in the Pacific, right about where we expect the equator to be. Okay, now that I'm on Earth's equator, I can fast forward time until the moon is on the celestial equator at zero degrees declination. So I'm going to, ooh, let me hit A for atmosphere so we don't have to deal with that. And I'll pause with K. Look, it's already close to the equator. So now I'm zooming in. I'm using the control button and the up and down arrows to zoom. You can also use the scroll wheel on your mouse. Now it's, it's fairly close to the equator, but it's not right on the equator. So let me back up a little bit in time. I'm, I'm tapping J. If you hold down shift, you can make smaller adjustments when tapping J and L. So right about there is pretty good. Now, how do I know exactly what the declination? It sure looks like it's zero. It looks like the center of the moon is on the equator. But to be sure, I would click on the moon, and then all this information pops up. And it will actually tell us what the declination is. Now, there's two options here. They say right ascension and declination, J2000, and right ascension declination on date. And I wondered for years what the heck the distinction was. I finally learned what that was over winter break. 
I'm not going to explain it because there's a whole lot behind it. Uh, but it has to do with the fact that the Earth is tilting like a top. And so thing, the coordinate system that we use is changing gradually. Okay, check it out. See how it says RA and then deck? That means the first number is right ascension, which we don't care about. The second number is the declination. And currently it's zero degrees, one minute, and 19 or 20 seconds. That's really close to zero, but it's not zero exactly. So here's what I'm going to do. I'll tap K to stop time. And now let me make adjustments. I'm, I tapped a J a couple times to go backwards. Notice how it's getting closer to zero. Let me hold down shift and make a smaller adjustment. There we go. If you tap J with no shift a bunch of times, it's gonna go super fast and that'll be annoying. So I wanna get this as close to zero as possible. It doesn't have to be perfect, but if you're really careful, the value that you get for the distance using the sine function, it will be, it will be amazing how precise that value is or how accurate it is. Okay, I'm almost there. This is the tedious part, but believe me, it's, it's less tedious than actual astronomical observations. Okay, whoop, perfect, whoop. There it is. So I've tapped K to stop time. You see how the clock is no longer running? You must do that because the, the whole point is that you want to have these two people make their observations simultaneously. Right now, I'm the observer on Earth's equator. The other observer would be at Earth's North Pole, and we don't want the time to change. So make sure the clock is stopped and don't mess with it. Do you remember what we're going to do next? Now that we've got the moon on the equator, celestial equator, at zero degrees declination, as seen by somebody on Earth's equator, we're going to go to the North Pole of the Earth. So I go back to location. And here's where you may run into a problem. I discovered this problem with the campus computers. It, it drove me nuts a couple semesters ago. If you just enter, well, you tell me in your head, what's the latitude for the North Pole? If you're actually at the North Pole, you're way the heck up at 90 degrees latitude. So if you actually enter 90 degrees, uh, what should happen is the, the computer should plop you up here at the very top of the map and adjust the scene accordingly. But for some reason, it sometimes gets stuck if you actually enter 90. But if you enter like 89.9, .9, it'll work. So uh, let me see if it works first on my computer. I'm going to hit tab. Great. It did. You see that? We immediately observed the parallax effect that we expected. Just a moment ago, we were on Earth's equator, and the moon looked like it was here. Now, because we went to the North Pole, the moon looks like it scooted downwards, because Stellarium takes all of that into account. It's a very precise program with a lot of data at its fingertips. So we've just witnessed the lunar parallax. What you just saw, the moon scooting down, that's, that's equivalent to when you switched eyeballs while you were looking at your thumb. OK. And of course, now we'd like to know what the declination is. What is this angle between the celestial equator and the center of the moon? Now you could try to just read it off of these lines here. Like the center's right about here. Well, if I back up just a little bit, see how this says negative zero degrees and 50 minutes of arc. How many minutes are in a degree? 60. So we're not quite at 60, we're at 50. So we're a little bit less than one degree down from the celestial equator. See that, the, this is the equator. One degree down is right here. You know, so from here to here would be a shift of one degree, it would be a parallax of one degree. And the, the actual parallax is a little bit less than that because the center is here. So know what, what sort of number you're dealing with. The, the lunar parallax should be some, some fraction of one, not quite one degree, maybe 0 0.8 degrees, 0 0.9 degrees, something like that. Um, but how do you know for sure? You go up here. So use RA and DEC on date. And remember, this first number is the right ascension. We don't want that. This is the number that you want. It says it's negative. That means it's below the equator. Zero degrees, 53 minutes, 59.5 seconds. And there is a space on the lab report for you to enter that number. Zero degrees, 53 minutes, and 59 and a half seconds. That is the lunar parallax angle. That's the angle that you're going to plug in to the sine function. Remember delta, sine of delta? This is delta. Okay, I think I've explained everything ad nauseum. I'll just give you that word of caution again. When you go into the location window, 
if you change this to 90 and you hit tab and you don't see the moon scoot down, like if the moon is still on the equator, that's a bug in the program. And that, that's gonna throw you off. So what you would have to do instead would, would be to try something like 89 degrees and 59 minutes. Get as close as you can to 90, but make sure that the computer is actually updating the perceived position of the moon. If you followed this video and read the instructions manual, then you should know if the computer is doing something funky. You'll, you'll know. Okay, so please show your work. Do everything that the manual asks for. It's gonna ask for a percent difference at the end. So let me point out here, uh, there's a whole bunch of information thrown up about the moon here. And way down here towards the bottom, no, it's, it's right here actually, distance. So first they tell you the distance from the sun, that's the distance of the moon from the sun. That's not what we're trying to calculate. We want the distance uh, from the observer. So they don't actually explain that here, but when they say, excuse me, when they say distance, they actually mean the distance of this moon from the, lo from the location of the observer. See where we're looking right now? We're looking as if we're from, or as if we're on Earth's North Pole. So this would actually be the distance from the Earth's North Pole to the moon. That is what you're calculating using the sine function. Earth's radius, polar radius over the sine of delta. When you crunch those numbers, the number that should come out or that, that will come out should be very close to this number. Very close. See this 404,762. So don't fake it. Don't just write that number down. I'll know. I, I need to see your work. I can check your work easily because I have a calculator. And your number should not look like anybody else's number because you're going to be on some day that's different from everybody else. Okay, now you may be thinking, wait a minute, how could my number be different if there's only one distance to the moon? Well, watch this as I speed up time. You see how the distance is constantly changing? That's because the moon does not move around the Earth in a perfect circle. It moves in an elliptical orbit. So the distance is always changing. But whatever number you calculate should match the number given here. Don't forget to hit K to stop time once you're, once you're finished at Earth's equator. Okay. I don't think there's anything left that I could say about this lab. Good luck.